Salt, Sugar, Fat by Michael Moss. This book is... If I had to sum it up in one word, it would probably be enraging. If you really want to know about some red ocean strategy type shit, then I highly recommend smashing that like button in case you haven't already for the YouTube algorithm. It helps with ranking and SEO and, you know, all this other stuff. And I really appreciate it because so much goes into these videos. The beginning of this book paints a picture of a meeting between government officials and the CEOs of like, what, the eight or ten top processed foods industry dominators. The research that went into this book, if I had to describe that in one word, it would probably be dedication. <laughs> 10 years after the meeting I was just talking about, everything got probably like 10 times worse. The secrets and lies, which made all of this even worse than it got worse, so if that makes sense, were covered up by the industry during that time. I don't know if they still are because this book is from 2013, but if they are, but if that's the case, I wouldn't at all be surprised. This part stood out where the author talks about the bliss point. P equals A sub 1, P plus A sub 2, C plus A sub 3, U minus B sub 1 dollar sign minus B sub 2, H minus B sub 3, Q. The P stands for purchase and the allure of fat and salt easily overcoming the H or the public's health concerns. The public's health concerns? Really? It's not like food companies are teaching kids to like sweets. It's rather that they are teaching children what foods should taste like, and increasingly so. This curriculum has been all about sugar. What basic research is shedding light on, and why the foods they're making for kids are so high in sugar and fat and salt, is that they're manipulating the biology of the child. He goes so, so deep into all of this shit. He even names, he name drops companies and people and executives and scientists and marketers and everything. <laughs> if you don't think that any of this is fucking insane. I heavily urge you to look at the, at the sugar contents of the next Coke can or bottle that you drink from. Chapter 2 of 14 introduces a man named Howard Moskowitz, who understood how to generate the greatest appeal among customers. He optimized sodas, cheeseburgers, chocolates, and pretty much every food. Like, he's like the god of this industry under the Milky Way. He probably even Milky Way bars, if I had to guess. Chapter 3 talks about innovation and rapidly driving up the importance of convenience in today's world. There are just so many statistics in this book to add to the dramatic nature of the narrative that it proposes to us, by the way. And Michael Moss, the author, like he'll give four or five different statistics pertaining to the same thing just to show us how drastic it can become so quickly in so many places from so many companies and foods and ingredients and it's just very insane and enraging. I don't know. A lot of people are worrying about money nowadays. And rightfully so, too. You can definitely put me on that list of people if you want. <laughs> but less people are worried about time. And... I think a lot less people than that are worried about energy. And with all the research I've done, I've really concluded that these things play off one another. And I've kind of noticed that those at the top of today's corporate, you know, totem poles are concerned with probably primarily their management of all three of these things. This to me is a little bit like Bad Blood by John Carreyrou. It's a book that was written by like a journalist or a reporter with a very specific purpose. It's a book of rhetoric, a book of agenda. And I think it's a purpose that greatly involves why the majority of people are not as energetic as we seem. I, I don't really know if the author kind of included any actual solutions to this for everybody. A lot of the potential ones <laughs> He and the interviewees of him had for themselves, he basically holds up high and then shoots them down with their help. But because of this, I do not think that he's trying to yelp to the global marketplace that we are fucked and that there's no hope. When I look at these things, I definitely see hope, but I also see that we need to look at it and look for it and like, here's why. Ralph Smart says that the truth can't be told, it has to be realized. Chapter four tells us about the rise in the public's concern for what these companies are kind of doing. It tells us with all the numbers of cavities and obesity kind of soaring. The name of this chapter is literally is it cereal or candy? None of these companies give up, but they are so focused on murdering each other that they feel nothing but the numbness of only doing that. 
I think the biggest thing here in the first maybe quarter of the book in general is kind of about cereal. It tells us a lot about the different histories of Kellogg's Post and General Mills and how they are or were for so long considered, you know, the big three of cereal, if you will. They really wanted to kind of delete the differences between breakfast and dessert. Chapter 5 of 14 is all about Coke. Some of the most disgusting marketing strategies I've probably ever heard of coming from the period of Jeffrey Dunn, who was nicknamed Bobby Bag, after comparing Coke versus Pepsi to a military war and saying that he wants to see as many full body bags as possible filled by his sa by his salesman. Coke is a ferocious company. It seriously is. And Michael Moss talks all about why in this chapter. He also talks about the reasons Jeffrey Dunn resigned as CEO, which is probably they're just as unbelievable as they are understandable. Really only given the rest of the fucking shit in this book. Chapter 6 talks about the record heights high fructose corn syrup had driven the sales of for processed food and drinks up to like squeeze-its and Kool-Aid bursts and tang and how these people made it seem like they were all as fruity as possible. So moms look at it and they rationalize like, well, you know, it's fruit, so that means it must be healthy. But it was still terrible. In fact, it was worse for you than the shit that they made before those. <laughs> so like, I don't know, when I look at these nutrition facts of such products six years later, I don't think they've gotten any healthier at all. These people target diabetics! Chapter 7 introduces us, us to fat, which is as much of a feeling as it is a pillar of the highest selling food industry products. Let me say, let me sum it up by saying this kind of stood out. Fat turns listless chips into crunchy marbles, patched breads into silky loaves, drab lunch meat into savory delicatessen. Like sugar, some types of fat furnish processed foods with one of their most fundamental requirements, the capacity to sit on the grocery store shelf for days or months at a time. Fat also gives cookies more bulk and a firmer texture. It substitutes egg water in lending tenderness and mouthfeel for crackers. It lessens the rubbery texture in hot dogs, deepens their color, keeps them from sticking to the grill, and as an added bonus, saves the manufacturers money since the fattier trimmings they use in making hot dogs cost less to buy than the minor cuts. Chapter 9 is all about craft and cheese, and it also talks about milk, but the part about the Philadelphia cream cheese and how they use Paula Deen as a marketing tool is like, influencer marketing has been around forever. And why that whole thing stops with Paula Deen? Well, that's also in the book. But when people say that there's too much fat or sugar, the people in the industry are just like, well, that's what the customer wants. We aren't putting a gun to their head to eat it. That's what they want. If we give them less, they'll buy less. And the competitor will get our market. So you're kind of just trapped. Chapter 10 tells us, about everything between meat and fat. And I, I did kind of find some chapters more compelling than others. I don't know why. You or I could probably come up with our own list of reasons. But chapter 11 covers a lot of different things that happen when you cause all these problems. They become literally so big that you're like, here, let's provide a problematic solution that makes it worse in order to hide pretty much everything that's already in our line of vision that doesn't have to do with sucking consumers' money out of their pockets. Like if Oreos start going insane with their flavors, originally having a couple like lemon and peanut butter and birthday cake and vanilla and chocolate, and then they start adding shit like banana split and s'mores, and it's like, what the fuck? Orange cream, sickle, <laughs> like what the fuck? Oh wait, it gets even crazier. That's just flavors. Then they're like, guys, we're gonna start putting twice the amount of health problems. I, I mean, sugar. Uh, I mean, pandemic or what's that stuff called? Oh yeah, frosting. And we're gonna call it double stuff. Or no, actually, let's do triple stuff. And if all of that is too big of a problem for you, that on top of the chocolate covered Oreos. That's okay. We heard recently that people are scared to go into aisles because we know they're scared they're gonna buy everything they see. So you know what? We're gonna have Oreo Thins for people who feel guilty about their loyalty to our brand. Again, this book is just <laughs> fucking enraging. It's really enraging. I don't think I found it any more enraging than entertaining and informative. Chapter 12 is the introduction to the author's insights and knowledge on salt. Chapter 13 talks about sodium and a lot of the science behind it. I don't think sodium causes as much an or deep 
of a concern. That doesn't really lessen the, 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 the like, the, the, what? there's some word I'm trying to use, I don't know what it is. <laughs> the scale? The magnitude of them? I mean, the actual psychological, like, the physiological consequences of what these companies are doing, or have, at least have done, for so long. It's like, they're doing some irreversible things with our bodies in ways that we don't understand. And I think that's a huge reason this book was even written in the first place. Chapter 14 talks about Frito-Lay and its domination, which I'll sum up by saying this. The baby boomers were in fact not eating fewer salty snacks as they aged, quite the contrary. In fact, the baby boomers consumption of all those segments, the cookies, the crackers, the candies, the chips, was going up. They were eating not only what they were eating when they were younger, they were eating more of it now. And that was what was causing the big success for those snack food companies all those years. The epilogue is about the insane investments that Nestle has put into growing its fortune of, I think, a hundred billion dollars. Which is like the highest number I heard in the whole book. And some things they really tried to do, like create what they called miracle drinks or fibrous wonders that treat those who go too far. And the end credits talk a little about the solutions and the future that people are really trying to look at. Apparently many of the executives of those companies will go out of their way to not eat the products. I guess you really could say health is wealth because of these things. In the last year or so, I really have been thinking about a world that surrounds money versus, you know, a world where it was never invented and like how they would look different. And I think the problems caused by this can really only announce to us as loudly as we are willing to hear that only we can save us. Quotes, if you want innovation, tell me where you want to go, but don't tell me how to get there. Who says the only food should be cereal? You're not a breakfast company, you're a breakfast food company. My daughter likes to eat cake for breakfast. It's just very hard to see yourself from the inside. If you take Lunchables apart, the most healthy item in it is the napkin. Nestle is a Swiss bank that prints food. It's like somebody is saying, let's let all those kids get fat, obese, and die. Candy? That's not food. There is nothing accidental in the grocery store. All of this is done with a purpose. Direction one, I recommend this book for anyone who wants to know what the fuck is really going on behind all the shit that so many of us eat today. Direction two, if you like this book, I recommend checking out The Obesity Code by Dr. Jason Fung and The Ultramind Solution by Dr. Mark Hyman. Salt, Sugar, Fat by Michael Moss. There's a link in the description if you guys wanna check it out and read the reviews, that and all the other books that I mentioned in this video. If you think there are any other books that you want me to check out and review, please let me know in the comments below. Also let me know if you checked out this book and you liked it. But go ahead and subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. I don't know why someone wouldn't subscribe after watching this far into the video, but hey, it is what it is. And if you've already subscribed, but you haven't turned on the notification bell to get a notification every time I drop a new video, that would mean the world to me. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find me everywhere, and I will see you then.